Hello everyone, and my name is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba. This is Experiment Design for Computer Science, Lecture 2, and this is my first uh, code lecture. So in this lecture, I talk to you a lot about uh, point estimators and interval estimators. And here in this video, I will go briefly over the um, markdown exam the markdown the, the R example that is attached to this lecture. So as you can see here, these what I have open in front of you right now is called R Studio. So R Studio is a environment for you to program in R. R is a script language that is focused on statistical analysis and visualization of data. It's very useful for the activities that we are going to develop in this course. And <clears throat> it's also not a very hard language. If you are familiar with Python, uh, if you are familiar with MATLAB, uh, you're gonna see a lot of things that are also familiar with R. It's definitely useful uh, to learn R. So what we have here, so in our studio, here what you see in the interface, you see these four quadrants. And I will briefly explain the interface so you know what I'm doing, and then I will explain the code. I will explain a little bit about how R works when it comes up, but this will not be very focused on working with R. So this is our studio, and when you open our studio, you have these four quadrants. In the top left quadrant, you have the editor. So here I have several files that I have opened. Uh, we are going to focus on this rmd file that is the example file, but you also have available to you uh, old code. Uh, this is just some code from previous classes and maybe you can look at some of it and get it as information to learn other ways to work with Python, with R. Um, studentdata.csv is a data file that we are going to use in today's uh, exercise. Uh, Compilo04.r is a data from Felipe's Campello course that we are using as a basis for this course. So this is also useful to see some other ways, especially to plot using ggplot. We are not going to use ggplot today, but it's very useful. It's much powerful than our native plotting abilities. So if you have some time, it's, it's really worth it your time to learn how to use ggplot. Uh, on, the top on the top right corner quadrant, we have the environment history and connections. So history lists all the comments that you have used in this uh, session. So if you want to redo an old comment, you can see it here. Environment lists all the variables that are currently open. So every time you open a variable, and uh, it's stored in the environment. Here you can modify the values of these values, this, uh, of these variables, you can delete them, etc. <clears throat> On the bottom right, uh, on the bottom left quadrant, you have console where you can type individual commands that you want to try. So you can do, for instance, oops, okay. One plus one, just like in Python, you can uh, type the comments directly here. And on the bottom right quadrant, you have what I call like the, the system uh, um, quadrant. So you have files that lists the files in your file system. So here we are at the lecture notes, inside of lecture notes, we are in topic number two, inside of topic number two, we are in code. This is the same uh, file tree that you have in the uh, GitHub <coughs> repository, okay? You have plots, every time you do a plot, the plot will be stored here, several plots will be stored here, so you can see old plots that you have generated. Uh, you have what packages are loaded. You can load new packages as necessary. Uh, when you type help, so for instance, if I do, do help mean, the help for the mean function will show here. And here in viewer, you can view several files that are not supported directly. So the main R script file is the R files, but today we are going to be using the RMD, R markdown. R Markdown is a notebook style of file. It's kind of similar to a Jupyter notebook in which you mix content and code. So you can write the content here, as you can see. And in the middle of the content, you can also write the code and see the results. 
So you can program, write a little bit, program, write a little bit. And when you open an RMD file, uh, our studio will give several options of how to produce a notebook. So we can get this RMD file and by choosing meet, uh, now I need to a uh, HTML file. So, oh, it's downstairs. Uh, where is my, where is my, oh, here. Okay, so when I knit, you can see that it generated this HTML file, which has the code, the text, and the results. So this is very useful for generating uh, reports, where you keep the code necessary to generate the report and the content in the same file. Uh, you can, as you see, if you notice, we have options not only for HTML, we can meet to Word, if you want to use Word, and more usefully, we can need to PDF. So here now I'm generating a PDF. And you see that I generated a PDF with the exact same contents. So you can right away uh, generate a, a PDF with colors and everything, a very beautiful PDF with your report. Okay, so it can be very useful to generate uh, class reports using our markdown. Now let's look at the code for uh, this lecture. Okay, so first we have an introduction to our markdown here. Uh, let me switch knit back to uh, HTML when I use it from time to time. Okay, so we can see here the text. As you can see, the text is in markdown format, so you can have you can have uh, titles here, you can have links, uh, you can also have like um, italics and uh, heavy. And here we have a code chunk. Here's just an example. In the code chunk, R Markdown supports other languages. I could put some other programming language here that is supported by the kernel. Here I'm saying that this is R code. I could put, for instance, LaTeX, LaTeX code if I want to describe an equation. Um, and this here is just the name. The name is used for references if you want to refer to certain specific chunk codes. It's like the label in LaTeX. So here is just a code to plot. And instead of compiling the entire R Markdown notebook, I can press Control Shift Enter and just rerun this code. And then I have the code here. Okay. Now I can do so here I'm plotting the cars. I'm having a scatter plot of the cars uh, data set. You can also add, uh, here are some help comments. You can add a new chunk, Control i You can preview the notebook with Control shift k <clears throat> And let's now go straight to the code for our lecture. So in this lecture, we talked about how we can use point indicators to represent data. So let's go back to the example that we used, a hypo hypothetical factory that produces coaxial cables. So we said that the, the resistance of the cables produced follow a Gaussian distribution with mean 50 and standard deviation two. So that's our population. It's a factory that produces cables with mean 50 and standard deviation two. But we don't know that. So we want to take a sample of 25 cables. So what we're doing here is that, well, it's good when you use code to generate statistics and uh, models always set the seed to a fixed value so you can reproduce the results and see how different analysis get different uh, obtain different results from the same data. So here we are generating random data from a normal distribution with 25 samples. We're taking 25 samples. The mean of the distribution is uh, 50 and the standard deviation is two. So let's execute this. And oops, why did you generate this many? What happened here? Oh, okay. I pressed the run button. All right, so here I press Control Shift Enter and I generate here my 25 samples. As you, as you can see, each of these numbers is one of the cables. So the first cable has resistance 52.7, the second cable has resistance 48.87 the third cable has resistance 50.7. So this is what you would expect to see in the real world, right? Uh, not uh, The nature is not perfect. So not every cable will have exactly the same resistance. There will be small variations depending on the precision of the process. Okay. Now, 
if we get the sample and we look at it, can we tell whether uh, from the sample, can we estimate the mean of the production? So as we saw in the class, the sample mean is an unbiased estimation. So let's calculate the sample mean for this sample that we just, uh, we just collected. So when we calculate the sample mean, we see here that the result uh, is 50.37. So this result, let me increase here since we're focusing on this window. Okay, a little bit bigger, fantastic. Okay, so this 50.3 is the mean of the production that we estimate based on the sample that we collect. And that's how we're gonna do in your experiments. Uh, for instance, let's say that you want to estimate what is the mean size of a dinosaur. We, you will collect several fossils, you measure their heights, that will be your sample. And from the sizes, you take the mean and you can estimate the mean size for the population of dinosaurs. Uh, one thing that is pretty cool in our studio is that you can write code in line. So if you wanted that mean inside the text, you could put our mean here. So let's just go back to the text. And as you can see here, so here I'm calculating the sample as you saw before. Here I calculate the mean. And here you can see that we have the same value in line. Okay, so if you want to write a report and have the values in line, you can do it here like this. Okay, now, <clears throat> because this sample, the, the, the estimated mean is not exactly equal to the population mean, to the parameter mean of the population, we want to know what is the estimated error of, what is the error of this estimate? How, how, uh, how, what's, how, low, how far away can we exp as, uh, expect this estimate to be from the true parameter? Uh, so we use the formula for the uh, mean, sample mean error that we saw in the class. So the sample mean error for that uh, sample is the standard deviation of the sample. So it's basically the mean of the sample minus the value of this. And we take the, the, the mean of that and take the square root of that. And then the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. You remember the number of observations in the samples. You remember that in the lecture, I told that the error of the estimator is inversely proportional to the number of observations of the sample. And we can see here in this formula, the more samples that we have, the smaller will be our standard error or sample error. So we calculate here and for this sample, the error is 0 0.52. So we can expect that the true value will be away from the mean value by about this much, okay? Now let's see what I said regarding the sample size uh, influencing the error. So here we're going to take three samples. One sample from the factory of size 10, so 10 observations, we take 10 cables. One sample, one sample with size 25, and one sample with size 50. And then for each of the samples, we're gonna calculate the mean and the uh, standard, uh, the, the, the standard, the error of the mean <clears throat> of the mean estimator. So let's calculate this. Well, the values are the same because we are using a fixed random seed, so we're gonna always get the same values, right? So here, for the sample with 10 elements, with 10 cables, our calculated mean was 49.8, which is quite close to the value. And the calculated error was 0 0.53, okay? For uh, the sample with, 20, with 25 observations, this time, because this is a different sample, we're gonna have a different estimate. Remember, every time you get a new sample, you're gonna get a different estimate. That's why it's important to know what's the error of that estimate, because it will be different for each sample. So for the second sample of size 25, our estimated mean is 49.54. And the error, the estimated error for this mean is 0 0.43, okay? And when we get a sample of size 50, so we get 50 cables, all our estimated sample, our estimated mean is 50.2, and <clears throat> the estimated error is 0 
okay? Notice a few interesting things. The first thing is that for all these samples, the estimated mean is relatively close to the mean, to the true mean. They are all relatively close to 50, which is a good thing. It means that our estimator is not a bad estimator, okay? Uh, on the other hand, we can see that although uh, this, when we increase the size of the sample, uh, we would have a more precise estimation. This is not always, this not always happens. It's true, but it does not always happen. So for instance, here in this example, the sample with 10 observations is much closer to the true value than the estimated based on the sample with 50, uh, 50, um, 50 observations. In this case, this is just luck. Okay, so sometimes we do have bad luck in experiment. That's why we need statistical methods to tell us how, luck, how lucky we, are expect, we can expect ourselves to be. <clears throat> you can see that although the, although the first estimate of the mean is closer, we don't really know the true val value of the parameter. So we don't know if this is closer. And we can look at the error and we can see that the error ranges we are uh, become smaller when we increase the number of observations. Okay. All right. Now this is based on uh, theoretical data. How would we do if we have real data? You go out to do your experiment. You put your data in a CSV file, and then you uh, want to use in R. So let's see a second example. The second example uh, I took from Campelo's course. It's a survey that he did with his students asking uh, the student height and the student weight for two different courses. So when you use data, the easiest way to use the data is to format in CSV format. As you can see here, CSV stands for comma separated values. So simply on the first line, you put the name of each data that you're collecting, the ID, the course, the gender, the height and the weight. And on each line after that, you put the data separated by comma. So student number one is from course PPGE. It's a female student. Uh, it's her height is 1.57 and her, her weight is 45.5 kilos and so on and so forth. So if you have the data shaped like this, you can go to R and you can load it into a variable called uh, using the method read.scsv. So this automatically reads for you a comma separated value and stores it in an R data frame. Okay, R data frames is one, is one of the main uh, R data structures. I will not cover in this video how to use R data frames, but it's worth your time to study it. And here we can see, we can calculate the mean of, um, Okay, there was an error here. So here we calculate the mean. So the mean height of the students in the, in the data set is 1.74 meters, and the mean weight is 72 kilos. And here we can see the entire data set. So we can see that the, all the data table was loaded, and our studio makes it very easy for us to browse, browse the data. Okay, so let's hide this. So let's say that we are interested in calculating the body mass index of the students. So the formula for the body mass index is weight divided by height squared. So we calculated the BMS index and here you can see something interesting in R. By default in R, if you have two, um, if you have array data, the um, <clears throat> operations are automatically um, how do you say, applied to the entire array, okay? So here we generate a vector called BMI, and then we calculate the BMI of the students and we add the BMI to the data frame. So let's see here, oops, the BMI. So now we have the same table as before, and we have a new column calculating the BMI for each student. Okay, very well. So, uh, the mean, we can calculate the mean BMI of the students. So let's look at it in with mean BMI with the estimated error with the function that we created for calculating the estimated error. So here, <clears throat> so for these students, 
the mean PMI is 23, and the estimated error for this is 0 0.59. So we can expect we can expect that this value of the, this mean PMI is uh, it has an error of this much. So okay, uh, in the lecture we talked about how uh, instead of using point indicators, we want as often as possible to use interval indicators. So how far away from 23 we can reasonably expect the true mean of the BMI to be. Okay, so for that we are going to calculate the um, <clears throat> the um, confidence interval. Okay, so the confidence interval is a calculation that requires a confidence value. Uh, normally we use 95, uh, so alpha equals to 0, 0. 0. 0. 0.05. This value uh, can be different depending on your application. For example, if you expect a lot of error in your, uh, in your data, for instance, if you are taking interviews with people and each person is very different, uh, you may be interested in a lower confidence interval so that you can get a more, um, a larger, uh, a bigger, <clears throat> sorry, a smaller range of feasible values. However, if your experiment is very precise, let's say a simulation that you can repeat many, many, many times, you can use a larger confidence value. And then you're gonna still have a reasonably small uh, re uh, interval. In this case, we're gonna use the default of 95%. So here we have the values. So we are creating a new variable just to avoid repeating students at BMI, students at BMI all the time. And we're going to use our confidence uh, value of 0 0.05 to get a 95% confidence interval, okay? So the formula, as we saw in the lecture, is that we have the means of the values. We use, because we don't know what is the true variance of the population, we're going to estimate the true, we're going to use the t-distribution. So we use the quantile of the tree distribution with the confidence interval, and the number of values um, minus one. Here's a bug. Number of values minus one as our uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so we calculate here, and here are our uh, BMI. So we can see that here is the BMI of all the students from this plot. And we calculated here the, esti the estimated mean. So this is the estimated mean for the population around 23, as you can see. And here we have the 95 confidence interval. So the 95% confidence interval is from this dot dash line to this dash line. It's very narrow. So we can have, we can have, we, we can trust, uh, if we can trust on this confidence interval, uh, the value of the mean, the true mean should be very close to these values. Okay, now uh, let's do a little bit more complicated. Let's break down and see if the BMI is different between male students and female students. <clears throat> so let's calculate this here, add the minus one that I forgot on the calculation of the confidence interval. So we break down the students. Uh, in R, you can use this switch to break down your uh, data according to some, uh, um, to some category. Okay, and then we can calculate the plot again using the same formula that we used before. Uh, feel free to take a look at the code to see how this plot is made. So now we have in red, we have the male students. In blue, we have the female students. And we can see that the confidence interval barely uh, covers each other. So there's a, there's, a, there's a chance that the BMIs uh, might be similar. And, uh, but and there is a chance that it's not. Remember that this confidence interval is, it's not like inside this confidence interval, we cannot say that it's more likely that the value will be closer to the center than not. That's not how we interpret confidence intervals. So you can just say, okay, uh, there's a chance that uh, the means of males and females are different. There is a chance that they are not. If the confidence intervals were completely separate, then you could say with more, co with more confidence, <laughs> that the means are different. Here you cannot. 
Okay, so just to give a different way to observe this, uh, it's also useful to use the histogram. The histogram can tell you the distribution of the values. So you can calculate the histogram in R just by using the hist function. And box plots also gives you a notion of the spread of the values, uh, except that the box plots are focused on medians and percentiles. So here <clears throat> we have the box plots of the BMI of the students depending on the course. And from this image, we can see that for both courses, the, BM, the spread of the BMI is uh, roughly the same. Okay. Finally, the central limit theorem. So in the course, we said that the central limit theorem allows you to use the means of samples as a proxy for the values. So what we're saying is that even for distributions that are not normal, the means of the samples, they tend to follow a normal distribution. So let's see this. Here we have, we take 100 samples and each sample has a sample size of 50. So if we look at this uh, plot, First, let's use the beta distribution. In the beta distribution, this is the, how the beta distribution looks like. But if we take 100 means, 100 samples of 15 observations, and we take the mean of each of these samples, you can see that the mean of the samples follows a roughly normal distribution. And that's interesting for a many um, evaluation, many uh, statistical analysis that we are going to do in the future. Just to show a different, uh, a different distribution. So let's look at the key square distribution. So if I rerun the code with the key square distribution, 100 samples, each sample has 50 uh, elements. You can see here that also the, the key distribution is not normal but the means of the, the, the distribution of sample means, it's hopefully follows normal. So that's also like we said in the class. Okay, uh, this is all for this video. And I hope that you take a look at the code so you can learn how to plot different kinds of plots in R. You can see how you can use R to produce your reports. And you can see how you can calculate the estimators, the mean estimator, the standard deviation estimator, the confidence interval using R. So I hope this was useful for you. And the link for the code is in the GitHub and also in the, uh, in the Manaba. So be sure to take a look. See you later. Bye-bye.